Hello everyone and welcome to Everyone Deserves a Chance. Today we have Angela Duncan, raised in Section 8 housing, relying on welfare and working from a young age. Angela Duncan's journey has been marked by resilience and determination. Within 25 years of personal finance study, a Florida broker real estate license, 220 and 215 insurance licenses, and Dave Ramsey coach certification, host of Empower Her Money podcast, speaker and author, Angela has honored her expertise to inspire hope through financial literacy. I'm reading your bio and I'm I'm just stopping on my tracks because I'm impressed. We're going to come back to this. Graduating with a finance degree from California State University, San Marcos, she embarked on a diverse career in banking, financial advising, owning a Remax office and establishing her insurance agency. Now, Angela is committed to closing the poverty gap by empowering others to change their financial future, firmly believing that no matter where one starts in life, they have the power to shape their own destiny. Angela, welcome. All right, Angela, I didn't do any justice by reading this. Um, I think uh, you're the one entitled to tell us more about yourself. Why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for coming. Yes. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can always say you can read someone's bio, but until you actually hear their story and hear the heart behind it, sometimes it can be hard to relate to. So, yeah, I grew up in poverty. I moved around a lot as a child. Um, I know that our money beliefs and what we learn about investing starts at a very young age. And so I definitely did not have proper training from my parents. Uh, My mom was an alcoholic. My stepfather abused me. And you throw poverty into all of that, you know, for every statistic that you can find. um, I shouldn't be where I'm at right now. And a huge part of that, um, I think, came from when I was a senior in high school and I saw a graph and it talked about the time value of money. And if you invested at 18 versus starting to invest at 30. And I saw that and I was just so intrigued by the chart. I said, I've got to figure this out. Like, I don't want to ever live this poverty life again. And I need to figure out how can I get out of this cycle? And so that kind of started my journey on really learning about money and about finance and just figuring out how to create a different lifestyle than I lived. And I had no idea how that was going to pan out or what route I was going to take, but I knew that I needed to start somewhere and do something different. That's funny that you say that. I want to pinpoint the age because I don't think I pay attention to it. So you were 25 uh, because I'm reading the bio. When when did that happen and how did it hit you? Like was a Tara moment with the white light that came over your head or it was just a decision that you took based on your experience up until then? Yeah. So I've always loved money and numbers and been fascinated by numbers. When I, Since I was a little girl, my Barbies used to play with play money and they were business owners. Um, but that chart that I saw was in an accounting elective class, my senior year of high school. So I was 17 at the time. And I, you know, I was, um, my mom was on welfare. I was sharing a room with my brother. Um, he's 10 years younger than me. And I did a lot of free babysitting, but I also started working at 14 because I needed to pay for just basic clothes or if I wanted to go to prom. And I think I was just frustrated because I would see other people and my other friends would have it so much easier, I thought. But looking back at it now, had I not gone through that poverty as a child, it may not have driven me to succeed. So starting at 17 and kind of being interested in investing, um, I had $100 saved. And this is a funny story. I had $100 saved and I went down to the bank and I had to be 18. So I waited till I turned 18 and I said, I want to invest. And this nice lady at the bank was like asking me questions. I really didn't know how to answer, you know, what are your investment goals and what do you want to invest in? I'm like, I don't know. Here's a hundred dollars. Help me. And so she gave me a little pamphlet and um, I wrote a check and I mailed in the pamphlet and I invested in a mutual fund and I lost $20 that year. And for me at 18, not having money, that was huge. And so 
I just needed to know that I wanted to continue on this journey. I had to learn more about money, about investing and not lose money. So that was probably my first loss investment, but you know, I continued on my educational journey. Thank you for sharing. Now, what was the first book that you picked up or the first tool they used? Yeah, um, I, I'm pretty sure it was Robert Kiyosaki. He was, you know, the first person that really turned me on to investing. I know a lot of people have followed him. I mean, I've been following him for almost 30 years. And then also Tony Robbins, because I knew I needed a mindset shift. I knew that I needed to have a different belief system than what I was taught. So between, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I think uh, maybe David Bach, Smart Women, Finish Rich, um, I, I just wanted to learn and be a sponge and absorb as much information as possible so that I can have a different lifestyle than I was living or that I had lived. I love that you keep dropping these, these names and you're dropping the books. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to do here in this podcast. But uh, tell me more. How can people find you on Empower Her Money? Is that the name of the website or what other handles do you have on social media? Yeah, so Empower Her Money is my website. You can go there. And um, if you go to my website, empowerhermoney.com, I do have a book that I wrote myself and it's seven uh, steps to get your financial house in order. So it's it's meant for you to start your financial journey and it's free. So it's an ebook that I wrote, not AI, I wrote it myself. And so if you go to empowerhermoney.com and click on the link, then you can get the book emailed to you for free. Congratulations. I wrote a book myself and I never published it. I still have it. People are going to surely believe it's going to be AI. But I work six months every day in the library of 42nd Street. I miss my family. I remember my kids were young when I did that. Yeah, it takes a lot of effort. And I really appreciate that you're putting it out there. And especially you're giving it for free. Like it's so much knowledge that you probably accumulated and you probably added into that book that, you know, I can't wait to actually go in and, and uh, read it. Um, on that note, um, I started with Robert Kiyosaki, but he wasn't my direct, direct pick. I started a little bit uh, before that, like uh, uh, Wallace, I remember, was one of, the, one of the first books that I picked up about money. And then uh, another one, Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. Yep. That was kind of my beginning. I, I stumbled across... Um, a friend of mine playing soccer and he sent me a uh, 20 minutes, I believe recording. And in that recording was like, almost like a brainwash. I was using it at 6 a.m. in the morning. And the first thing that I hear was like, imagine you're leaving the port from Miami and you're going to New York and there are two ships, right? Or you got two options. You can use the GPS. So you know exactly where you're going. Or you just let go of the thing and you're going to go whatever it's going to take you, hoping you're going to get to New York. So I'm like, my God, something's missing. And then a huge truck goes by me, running faster than me. I'm like, God, I'm doing 20 miles an hour on the highway. So that was uh, that was my very beginning. And then I started stumbling across other books. But Kiyosaki was one of the first events that I actually went to. I wanted mm -hmm. to see him live. I went to LaGuardia Airport. Uh, he had uh, one of the wealth tours that was going on through the country and I missed him. He wasn't there. So during that, I think this was 2016 for me. I, I started recently looking into the financial independence stuff. So um, I, uh, I went to LaGuardia airport and I got in the room. There was a nice man talking about Kiyosaki and they were offering uh, part of the program was a book and was a thick book. I remember very nicely wrapped. And it's like Kiyosaki is giving this away and I'm sitting right next to the speaker. I'm literally in the first row. I always pick the first row so I can pay mm -hmm. attention. I relate with them, they look in my eyes. I feel like I'm getting a bit more than when I'm sitting on the back seat all the way back in the last row where my phone, you know, I get distractions back there. So I'm, I'm right next to the guy and the guy says, you know, there are a lot of aware people in the investing world and there are a lot of people asleep. So it says, uh, he, he speaks about something else. And the next minute he says, and this, I'm giving this book away to the first person that touches me. Man, mind you, I could have touched him right here. It was literally right. my, the extension of my hand. A guy from the back comes in flying. Oh, my goodness. The guy. <laughs> I got up. I went to the bathroom. And I never got back in the room. 
I'm like, the universe rewards speed of action. I was in the best seat in the house, the best spot, although I wasn't aware. And that's kind of my, my, my Tony Robbins came in play right after that. I'm like, I got to wake up, man. I got to find our awareness. I had the fire. It was burning. I had everything there, except I missed the spark, which mm -hmm. actually I missed all the opportunities up until then. So that was the beginning of me investing. And then from there on, I'm like, okay, any opportunity comes my way, it's mine because that's why it came to me. So right. that's, how, that's how I've learned. Now I want to get back to, to empower her money because I have a whole bunch of questions that I was talking to you about the introduction, all that. How do we cross paths? But I'm more intrigued on to the program that you created because I'm sure there's a lot more to it. I only have... I would say since 2016. So I'm looking at seven years into the financial world, right? Where I'm uh, diversified, I'm doing lots of things. But you've been doing this for so long, man. I'm reading this here, like 215 insurance licenses, Dave Ramsey coach certification. I barely read Dave Ramsey's book and I'm still like, wow, I got to do it again. So you're, you're a coach on that line. So tell us more about the program. Yeah. Well, one of the things that you just talked about and is my number one advice for anyone who's looking to invest is that you need to invest in yourself first. So I have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars hiring a coach, going to seminars, reading books. And, you know, you want to figure out what field that you want to learn more about. And if it's not investing, maybe you want to further your trades, you can create more income for your family but invest in yourself first. So you really have to look at and changing your mindset that if you're going to read a book or you're going to go see Tony Robbins in person, I agree with you. I sit towards the front, if not the front row, because you get the biggest impact from that speaker being in proximity to them. So that's always my first thing is I tell people, figure out what is it that you want to learn more about and invest in your education. Um, so part of the, parching, the coaching program that I do is we do talk about that. Um, but um, I give an example, you know, for example, if you opened your phone and you pulled up Google Maps and you typed in an address, well, Google's not going to tell you where to go unless you know where you began. So the first thing we always look at is where are you at today financially? What is your income? What are your debts? How much money do you have to actually invest? And we start from there. And then I like to do goal planning and it's fun. You know, I'm a big vision person. So I like to create a vision board and I put it everywhere. I put it in my office. I put it in my car. I put it in my bathroom, you know, anywhere that I can visually see my goals so that every day I'm reminded that I have a purpose. And if I'm not saying yes to things that serve my purpose, I'm saying no to things that don't. So I am huge on time management. I'm huge on making sure that my time is spent to further my mission, which with Empower Her Money, which I launched this year, um, I'm a serial entrepreneur and I finally wanted to get to a point where I can provide education to women. And I really do focus on women because I feel like we think differently um, when it comes to investing. We're very heart centered, whereas our male counterparts, you know, oftentimes they're logical. They're thinking with their heads. It's a numbers thing. Um, women tend to invest with their heart. They go to speakers that they can feel their heart and this energy. So I, I focus on women because I can relate. I can teach them how I would want to receive education. And so talking to women, especially women business owners who similar to yourself, are working long hours, they're not necessarily paying attention to their money. And so I want to help them automate their process to be able to look at their numbers and to hit their goals faster, because that would be my number two piece of information is if you want to get better at something, not only are you investing in your education, but hire a coach. Like if you think about all of the amazing athletes, you know, from um, Michael Jordan to Venus Williams, they all have coaches because they need that accountability. They need someone to look at them from an outside perspective and give them advice on how to achieve their goals better. So I love that. I love sitting down with someone. I love going through their goals, figuring out what, it, what is your purpose? What is your mission? What do you want to accomplish? And then I'm there for you know any setbacks that will happen, but I'm also there as your biggest cheerleader. Like I want to see you win. And so sitting down, figuring out where am I, setting goals, and then making sure you're diligent with your time so that you're accomplishing those goals as quickly as possible. 
and hopefully getting you to spend more time with your family. Um, Cause I would say that was definitely a lesson that I learned the hard way. I was married, we were together for a long time and we ran businesses together and we were an amazing business team, but we failed at being married. We failed at dating. We failed at just making sure that our marriage was a priority. And we worked crazy long hours. I mean, Christmases, Thanksgiving, I can remember, we probably went four years without taking a vacation. And unfortunately, that marriage ended because we stopped being married and we focused so much on our business. So I really do you know, tell people to, you, you have one life, you don't know if you're gonna be here tomorrow. So while we are working hard to accomplish our goals, part of your goals should be, if you're in a marriage or in a relationship, to make sure that that relationship comes first. I'm so glad that we transitioned to the most important part of my interview. <laughs> Thank you so much for paying attention and helping me this way. Yes, that's the pain point that I'm going through. And that's exactly where most of the entrepreneurs, uh, my age, males or females, they go through the same stages of development. And this is where the challenges are coming into play because we do put the 18 hour into the business and then. There's not much left for family. Yesterday, I had somebody interviewing me. Um, I'm part of a group called Front Row Dads. And uh, it's a group of entrepreneurs. They're part of uh, Go Abundance, which is another group that I've, I've been uh, networking, networking with for the past uh, seven, eight years now. And um, the question that he asked me says, uh, when was the last time when you took your wife on a date? and I looked at him and I knew the answer, but I was ashamed to say it, but this was like a vulnerability call. So I'm like, you know what, man, I'm going to be raw and honest. In the past seven years, not even once, ever since we had our first child, not even once. And we had opportunities. My mom was here. She stayed with the kids. Her mom was here for like four months, three months. We, we had opportunities along the way. It's just that we were busy in doing other things and we both worked from home. My wife is home. I was home for years. We're home and we totally neglected taking time for ourselves. So at the end of the day, we missed the, the balance check that we, that couples usually do, you know, like, how was your day? What did you do? What did I miss today? Like, what do you think I should improve? That small chit chat talk, it's been missing out of my relationship for a long time. So it, it goes to a bottleneck every time. We, we do this. I work hard. We do everything we got to do. She's taking care of the family. She does absolutely everything, an amazing job home. And I do an amazing job away from home. And nine months into it, bottleneck, like, okay, to the point of almost divorcing. I'm not even like, it's really, really hard because we're picking up a relationship that was left off nine months ago after one hour conversation. Mm -hmm. So then we grab another book. We, we go through our own. We don't go to... Um, I love the idea of mentors and things like that, but we don't go for counseling for everything. Like we do have mentors, I have lots of mentors in multiple areas of my life. Um, now I'm looking into time management, like I was telling you earlier, but we just don't, we can't quite bridge the gap. And the gap doesn't get bigger, but we're mindful that it's there. So we want to close it once and for all. And now I picked up a business recently, Jess Electric, and this is a woman-based minority. So a woman that was running a business and she wasn't successful based on her efforts because she was a one-man show. One-man show can't do the meetings, the appointments, the applications, the forms, take care of the workers, scheduling, the whole shebang, man. And this is a service business. Mind you, you have to go out in the field and do the work. After you do the whole office side of it, you have to put your tool toolbox and just go out in the field and do it. So I picked up this business because she was in the same spot as I was in a family way. And I'm like, okay, hold on a second. Business side, I can fix this. Now, because you know men are into fixing problems, right? She's thinking with her heart, just like my wife is doing. My wife is like, okay, this is great. We're gonna be, we're gonna be moving to Florida. I'm like, hold on, I, I thought we're moving to Dallas, Texas. Like I was committed a thousand percent to move to Dallas. She's here, yeah, but I don't feel it. Yeah. So yes, you're right. There's a huge, huge gap between the feelings the men have and the feelings that men can access. And decision, it's based on a completely different set of skills than women do. I agree with you. My wife always says, I'm like, how about we sell that house? She says, what for? Well, this is the opportunity. I'm excited. I got the numbers. 
So don't worry about anything. The business is great. I got the numbers. And she says, like, you know, it doesn't feel right. I gotta, I gotta look into it. I, I'm like, how do I, how, how can you feel when you didn't even look at the numbers? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. kind of the conflict that goes through my head. And uh, that's to me and to my own terms, how to deal with my own demons. But yeah. to her, it goes through a totally different set of filters. And I'm glad you're coming forward with your program because um, my wife is going through Joe Dispenza's classes right now. And she's talking about trauma. Meanwhile, I'm reading all the business books. I'm talking about numbers and scaling. And <laughs> so I can see the gap getting created all over again. So I'm working on breaching my gap by spending uh, Wednesday afternoons with my family. I'm doing my best to be home earlier, to go to the pool for a few hours. Uh, Friday, like today is Friday, the day of recording this podcast. I'm going to work to get home earlier. And I'm thinking about six o'clock so I can take the, pe the kids to the beach. Uh, Saturday is a home run. I'll be home. The thing is, my wife needs a day off now. And she's going to stay in house and her day off is she's going to work on my website. She's going to work on my social media. She's going to help me grow my business, but I'll take the kids out. So it's like daddy and me day with both of my girls. We're going out on a mall or whatever. We're going to go. We're going to spend time together. And then Sunday uh, is like a family time. Saturday ends with dinner, dinner with family. And I take my wife out because uh, I feel like she worked enough for the week and for the day. She doesn't need to cook on the last uh, part of the weekend and Sunday uh, it's a family day complete full family for all of us but mind you I'm giving them two and a half days of full attention out of seven that's not balanced I I need help that's definitely not the balance that I'm looking for I I, I need at least 50 50 so I I'm I'm this is the the challenge that I'm going through but um, I'm going to go be different for everyone. You know, everyone is going to figure out what their balance looks like. And I encourage you too, especially when you're making those decisions about where to move or about selling the house, ask her how she feels instead of how, you know, like, what do you think about this next time? Say, how does that make you feel? Because yeah, now know. you know so she's coming from the feelings and from the heart. Coming from a teacher from you, I really appreciate it. Um, it's a difficult question to ask, how do you feel? And it's something that uh, I mentioned before. I'm going to put it out there again. As men are growing up, we are always pushed by, I don't know, it was my family, my father, my mother, and society, the school, toughen up. Mm -hmm. So in the lack of other word, I don't want to use it here. You have to become tough. So what does it mean? You have to not show your weaknesses in the male world. If you are feeling and you're expressing it, you're weak. As, as you learn how to hide them, you, you gain more value on the scale going up in business. As you learn how to be a poker face in business, it's like, you know, I want to do business with that guy. He's not giving anything away. He knows what he's doing. Reality is completely different. It's just appearance. It's fake. But we've learned how to do this for years and years and years. And then it's difficult to actually access the feelings. And it's difficult to ask that question because when my wife says that I feel this, the first thing I'm thinking, I'm like, what do I feel about this? What do I feel about it? I'm like, God damn it, I don't feel anything. I'm like, where's that feeling? Like, how, did, how does she surface that kind of feeling? So then I have to go in meditation. It takes me a whole hour to get to any kind of feeling to begin with. I got to pinch myself to see if I feel it. I don't feel nothing. I feel numb. Well, yeah, it was a pinch. So what? I'm still numb. So yeah. this is part of the society. And I think it has to do with the financial education as well. Mm -hmm. The brainwash of the society, I think it's here and it starts early on. And it starts with the cartoons that we watch on TV that Disney made. I don't know how many years ago. Right. It's, I see it. I'm watching cartoons with my kids once in a very blue moon or sometimes by mistake. And the first thing I see is like, they're introducing vaccines. This is a syringe. Kids, I'm like, this is for two years old. Turn it what off. They turn it off. Don't this? let them watch it. No, they don't. I turn it off. But then I hear the next thing is like the misconceptions of the world. They're already proven to be wrong. The next thing I hear is about uh, um, eat, um, um, I don't know, uh, milk, I drink milk. I Let miss know. having like a CD player in the house because my daughter will tell you this. She just turned 20. Um, wherever we would drive, I would be listening to books on CD. 
you know, I, she knew who Tony Robbins was from a very early age. She was reading um, Dave Ramsey books when she was in elementary school, because I really protected the information that was going into her brain um, to, we, you know, I didn't have cable for her where she could watch cartoons. And if she wanted to listen to music, then we're going to turn on what mommy wants first. And then I'll let you listen to a song. And she used to get angry. She's like, mom, why can't you be like everybody else? Why can't you let me listen to Selena Gomez? And I said, well, I think that the message that Tony Robbins is going to give to you will help you later in life. And she's like, but I'm a kid. And I think she appreciates it now and understands it now. But as parents, it's our responsibility to control the content that's going into their brains. We can't say, you know, oh, let them go on TikTok or let them have social media and not at least spend the time to put good information into their brains too. Even if they don't want it, it's going to sink in and they're going to remember it later. It's it's crazy. Uh, you're right a thousand percent. So the, the fact that we get tablets and cell phones and all the apps on earth, man, it just makes it a little bit more difficult for us to, to stay on top of it and control it. I went to school with my daughter the other day and uh, it was a science fair and I want her, I want to enroll her in the science class. And I asked the question, so what is this all about? And the lady looking at me says, she turns to my daughter and she says, do you play Minecraft? It's like Minecraft. I'm like, no, she doesn't. And I do not support that. I moved away from there. I'm like, how about we go to the art class? How about you taking uh, art classes and you're going to join the Girl Scout? So, you know, it's even <laughs> science is supposed to be about science. Now it, it all of a sudden turned into Minecraft and games. And I'm like, no, man, this is not what I'm teaching my kids. And this is regular public school. For the right. first time, we're actually going to enroll our kids to public school. Because it was a demand from our daughter. She wanted more kids and she wanted to do other things. She wants to see how it is. We, we gave in a little bit of the pressure and we did it to see how it works here in Florida after we moved. Yeah, I was going to yes. say, don't get me started on, on the public education. No, we're not, I don't want to go that rabbit hole. No, I just, yeah, I like but to- I, I will make one, one point with it. You know, if you think about um, the way that the IRS tax code is created in the United States, it's very entrepreneur, right? They're, they're promoting capitalists. They want you to be a business owner. There's so many tax codes that you can take advantage of that help you with taxes as a business owner versus an employee. But yet our school system that's been created almost 100 years ago was created- to create employees. They wanted to teach you, you know, from sitting in your classroom in a line to having a teacher, one person that's telling you what to do. They were taught to be employees, but we have evolved so much since then. And the public school system has not. So that's why, you know, oftentimes a lot of parents choose homeschool or private schools for a different type of education, but not everyone has access to that. So how do we create a movement to change the school system to promote capitalism to promote entrepreneurs to teach them money that's a very good question this is one of the efforts that i'm putting up here um this is the one of the reasons that this podcast became a podcast to begin with a way of uh, giving people more tools and in, in opening their eyes to people that need it to open their eyes into the possibilities that are out there and you're a great example you you came in you overcame so much I'm an immigrant. Again, I'm, I overcame my whole uh, communist mentality by moving to the United States. And then uh, even here, I hit another wall for almost 20 years. I rewired my brain to become a worker in the United States. I just changed territories and countries, but I didn't change actually anything. Mm -hmm. Finally, when I got to the business side of things, I'm like, hold on a second. I need to know what the hell is going on with my money every day. And I don't need somebody to tell me how much money am I allowed to make in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. which is my boss. So that's kind of, but it, it all starts, like you said, with reading a book, personal development, going to a seminar, spending the money and being committed to your craft, whatever that is. Even if you're a, uh, an electrician and I own an electrical shop now. So even if you're an electrician, you're, you're a beginner. Man, there's so many books out there about you being a better guy. And every time you do better yourself, you get better wages. And you can use the wages to invest. You can use the wages to invest in yourself. Go to Tony Robbins, right? I love Tony Robbins, man. I keep talking about Tony Robbins. I don't know anybody else better than him. So I'm like, let's just let's keep it that way. Let's <laughs> keep it yeah. simple, right? Yeah. All right. I want to come back to um, a couple of questions that I have here. 
Um, how do we cross path? This is important because I want to relate to you and I want people to relate to us because we're talking about taking courses and how do we cross path? Right. Get into the right rooms with the right people. And, and I always feel like, you know, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to learn more from other people. So um, a lot of people know about Grant Cardone. You know, he's got some amazing marketing and an incredible experience um, behind what he's doing. But it comes into getting into the right rooms, finding the right chats. You and I crossed paths. I saw that you had a podcast and I raised my hand. I took action and I said, hey, I would love to be featured on your podcast. How can I help you grow your audience? And so it's coming from contribution. But had I not been in that room that you had posted and took action to raise my hand and say, hi, then, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. So yeah. action is a huge piece. If you're not taking action, then then what's kind of the purpose of being in the right rooms if you don't actually implement what you're learning? I agree. And I want to take a notch farther. I am in those rooms and that specific one that we met because I'm paying for it. I mm -hmm. am a paying member of a mentorship program and that's how I end up being in that room. Uh, paying for it is just a commitment that you take that you're actually going to put the time and effort to do what you say you are doing. Because sometimes I slack and I'm like, God damn it, I pay so much money for that goddamn thing. I got to be up there. I got to get up to par. So I got to see what the hell's going on. Like I'm, I'm not wasting my time. It becomes important because I pay for it. I give it a value. Right. So that's why I push to um, paying for your stuff because then you're entitled to ask the right questions. You're entitled to the guy that you actually paid for. So that puts me on the front seat. Every time on every event, that puts me on the front seat. I paid for it. I'm, I'm looking for the biggest return of my investment, the biggest ROI. That's what I'm looking for. And right. I always get it by taking huge action. And for you, man, it was amazing. We just, it was like, okay, let's do it. Haven't I met the lady on time management two weeks ago? I would have opened that chat again in probably a week from now. But I've learned with her by meeting her that in order to become effective on time management, you have to do things as they come at you. So mm -hmm. that's exactly what you did. The moment you've seen that, you act on it, you put, you put it out in the universe. I received it in the next second. And I'm like, okay, I can't say no. It's going to be a yes right away. And right. that's exactly how things are happening. That's how I bought my first house. That's how I bought my second. That's how I got into the opportunities. That's how I signed up into Cardone classes. That's how I went to Tony Robbins' uh, events, live in-person events, by saying yes and figuring it out later. Right. Because the questions of money is always coming. Like $15,000 for that program, that's a lot of money. I'm like... Uh, can you do the numbers backwards? How much is going to cost you if you don't know this? So that's that's why I wanted to put it out there. I am part of Legends Equity Group, and I'm doing. Uh, I want to put a big shout out here for Legends. Legends is the syndication that actually took me over the hump of knowledge. They took me under their wing, under their arm, and uh, they've decided to show me the deal from inside out. Mm -hmm. So I am a general partner into my first deal after six months of hard work, 18 hour days into the syndication. And I can't be more grateful that they allow me this opportunity. There are a lot of coaches out there. Uh, a lot of people are doing the syndication model. It's just that I resonated the most with this specific group. And that's why I want to give them a shout out. Yeah. Um, and I'm a big fan of Alex Lovely. I've watched him. I'm, I go to his um, webinars that he does. And, you know, he's also another heartfelt person who is just giving back. So he's an incredible mentor. Tell us more about the people that you invest with, like your personal finances. What, what groups are you part of and you are investing with? Because you're a financial coach, but obviously not a coach that just gives advice. You're a coach that is involved and I'm sure you have investments. Yeah. So um, first I'll tell you um, a story where I, I lost money. Um, so I went to Grant Cardone's real estate summit last summer, and it was the first time I had been to a summit. And if anyone's been to a summit, they know like he does an incredible job of teaching, but also getting you excited about investing in real estate. I think one of the things that um, I did not learn from that, that um, I took away and ended up being a huge loss for me was that you need to vet out who you're investing with. And there, I got together with a group of people and we were all pretty new to commercial real estate investing. We put an LOI, we went under contract um, for this place in North Carolina, but 
we hadn't done it before. So we thought we could just figure it out. And we ended up not figuring it out. And I was um, the key contributor to the escrow and we ended up canceling the contract, but it was past our inspection period and I did not get the escrow back. So I learned a very expensive but valuable lesson that if you're going to invest with someone, you need to make sure that you spend enough time with them that you truly know that they they know what they're doing, um, that your values align with them and that they're going to protect you as the investor. And so while I lost money on that, I was not going to let that stop me from continuing my education route to invest in real estate again. Um, I am invested with Grant Cardone. I am a partner with him in one of his funds. We purchased uh, an office building in Arizona. It's doing very well. Um, He pays me every month and I don't have to do anything with it. And another person I am invested with Legends, Alex um, bought a storage unit in Fort Pierce And I had the opportunity to get to know him and meet him and I trust him and he's very educated, he's experienced. And so I did invest in that one as well. I have a couple others in different parts of the country, but again, if I didn't spend the time to get to know the person, to know that they are an expert in their field and that they are gonna protect my investment, um, I've learned that, you know, you you have to know who you're investing in. You can't just put money in and expect that someone took a course and that they're going to be able to figure it out because this is an extremely tough market right now with insurance rates, with property taxes, with interest rates. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, you could lose a lot of money. And oftentimes when people lose money, they don't want to tell anybody because they feel, you know, stupid or whatever. And then they stop trying. And that's the wrong thing to do. If you learned your lesson, figure out how to do it better next time and keep moving forward. Otherwise, how else are you going to create wealth if you're just going to stop? What's the point of having the education and meeting these people if you just stop investing? I don't want to work my entire life and have to worry about my retirement. I want to work and tell my money what to do. And I want my money to work hard for me because at the end of the day, I'm taking care of myself. There's no loan that I can get for retirement. You can get a loan for a house. You can get a loan for a car. Your kids can get a loan for their education, but you can't take out a loan to retire. So making sure that your money is working hard for you, investing with the right people is so important. I'm so uh, glad that you said that. Vetting the syndication took me over two months of due diligence every single day on every partner. And I went back and I vetted the partners of the partners too. Mm-hmm. So I went back and phone calls and, and did my own research on uh, on the deals that they have done prior to coming up to the deal that I was invested with. So I, I did the due diligence and I came to a full stop What I realized that I gone, I went down on the rabbit hole by doing so much homework on the syndicator because now all my fears came forward. I, I was aware of all my fears, but luckily with the personal development tools that I had in hand, I was able to overcome and realize this is based out of fear, it's not out of love, has nothing to do with what I want to do next. And I was able to pass that and enter. And six months later, I'm a, I'm a, a partner into a deal, which is my first deal, by the way. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Yes, you said something there and I want to touch up on it. You lost money on your first deal. Well, this is the end of investing for a lot of investors. Mm -hmm. That's the total end. That's the the no-nos of the no-nos. And you were able to pass that based on your development and your knowledge. So, you know, I want to commend you for it. It's awesome. And whoever's listening right now, you have to understand this. We're real, as real as it gets. And we make mistakes like everybody else. Mm-hmm. The difference of us being successful is that we pass by those, we leave them behind. And we always look forward to the new opportunity that comes out of this learning. So we're taking it as a, you can put it out there as a tuition fee, right? If there would be a financial university for commercial real estate investors, which is not, this would be the tuition fee they would pay. Or you don't have to pay the tuition, but let's put it out there. Over $50,000 in fees I've paid in the past six months just going to courses and seminars and webinars to learn about the syndication model. Mm -hmm. So losing $50,000, if that's the case ever, into the commercial space, and I don't know the numbers for you, or spending the $50,000 to learn about the same exact procedure of closing, it's the tuition fees, the same thing, it's just paid in a different way. 
or if you want to you know bring it up a notch i was away six months out of the year away from my wife and kids how about that price hmm. how about the best time of their life when my kids were like three and four hmm. i i took six months out of that time to learn well i have people that ask me so how how did you do it how did you get your six months i'm like bro please mind your business, do what you got to do, because I don't want to dump six months of knowledge and pain on you. I really don't. It's it's a process. You got to learn. You got to do. You got to be places. I flew out every weekend almost. I was away for four days. I came home for one, two, said hi to my kids and my wife, back on the plane, back to an, another event. Mm-hmm. And it's it's part of development. At the end of the day, everybody has their own individual journey. And you choose what to do. I just wanted to take the elevator and not the stairs. Everybody's looking for the shiny object. And I'm not a, I'm not a fan of it. I'm mm-hmm. not telling you guys to go for the shiny object. Commercial real estate is the, the shiny object. It's the, the crop of la creme. The top of the top is the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. Well, you can't get there. It's not difficult. Anybody can enter into a syndication model. It's just time and commitment. And you have time. You have money or you have knowledge. You got to leverage them. One way or the other, if you leverage two combined, you do. You have time and money, then it's very easy to get the knowledge because you have time and money, right? Then if you have knowledge and time, you don't have any money. Then you put your knowledge at work uh, and your time, and then that equals the opportunity. So either or you combine two of those, that's, that's the secret uh, to getting to where you want. But to me, I wanted to condense time. And that's not a hack. I'm not teaching anybody no hats. Condensing time means you're putting 18 hour days into the job. That's condensing right. time. There's no condensing time. Time is the only thing we got. So you're not, you're just stealing, you're robbing yourself out of this life of that time by doing that. But you're getting to the money first, which was kind of my goal. The reason why I entered a commercial restaurant was for money. I didn't enter because I want to meet new people. I knew a lot of people. I had a lot of people on my agenda. I didn't, I couldn't get back to my relationships. I entered because of money. I was driven money. Well, Alex taught me a big lesson with his Course of Miracles program that he has. That's not it. Mm-hmm. That's not it. It wasn't money. I thought it was money initially. It wasn't money. It's not. I, I have enough to stay home with my kids and family and enjoy a peaceful life if that's what I was looking for. It was but deeper. I found out, yeah, I found out it goes way deeper than that. It's a legacy. It's the one time in a billion opportunity that I got to be here on earth based on the pool of DNA, right? I won the lottery. I have guys calling me on the phone. It's like, sir, you won the lottery. I'm like, yeah, I know. 43 years ago when I was born. (laughs) And one of the things you touched on too, which I love, you know, what you're doing here and what I do with Empower Her Money is we're putting out content and we're teaching people. So you don't necessarily have to have money to go down this journey. There's lots of free education. So you can go to YouTube, you can listen to podcasts, Um, I just watched five days with Tony Robbins with own your future. And that was on YouTube and it was free. So you don't necessarily have to have money to invest in yourself, but you definitely need to have the time. You definitely need to take the time and actually do it. And there's so many resources that are available now that weren't available for us as when, you know, when we were younger, we didn't, I didn't have the internet. I I would say there's too many. I would say there are way too many resources right now. I I started looking at the commercial space and then first that he came forward was Rod Khalif, somebody recommended, and then was Jake and Gino, and then right after was Michael Blank. And then uh, all of a sudden I have Tony, uh, not Tony, what's his name? Um, Grant Cardone, right? I was going to his events and his salespeople are awesome. They destroyed my phone. I got like 6,000 emails in a matter of two months. So there are so many people out there and they have content and it's all good. And most of it is free. Most of it is free. I follow them on LinkedIn, believe it or not. And a lot of the articles that they post, they're actually very knowledgeable and they're high level. They're not even beginners level, they're high level. But yes, let's touch base on a couple of things. In order to enter a syndication, man, you can do it with no money. You can have the skills and knowledge to enter a syndication model by just by living next to the property. So mm-hmm. that's one of the position boots on the ground. You live close to a property, man, you can get yourself into a syndication deal because us as syndicators, we're doing deals all over the country. 
and you need a person to be on the spot when the insurance comes in for a claim or something happens. And you also need a second pair of eyes on the managers of the managers, right? You mm -hmm. got to manage the management firm that is taking care of your asset. So that's boots on the ground position. Another one is asset management. Asset management, you need to do lots of things inside a syndication to manage that specific asset. So you can take a role there. Or another one, a customer relationship, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be in touch with your investors. So right. you have to send them reports, documents. You can be that person. Just be sitting on your own behind computer somewhere, I don't know, hundreds of miles away, and be that, that relationship manager for that specific syndication. And that's what I do because I'm a process person. I make sure that the paperwork's done, the wire comes in, you have updates on the property. I am amazing at process, but understanding what are you good at so that you can figure out which role on the team that you are going to provide value. Absolutely. I met a lady um, that she was a wholesaler before. She's extremely successful right now with a different syndication group with massive capital. And uh, she was a wholesaler before and she is good at bringing deals in. She's the source for deals. Like she has the deals. She brings the deals. She knows how to get them. Her skills are used to the maximum syndication by bringing deals in. And right. that's not the only scenario that I know. And you get paid for it. That doesn't mean you have to put a penny in it. You have right. to bring the deal to the right syndicator and get it done. And there's another one, uh, uh, finding the money, right? Having the right connections. You're, I don't know, you're in financial services for years where you are close to a group of people that you know have enough wealth or they're uh, just investors. It's easy to work with existing investors because they already know what a deal is and how a profitable, profitable deal should look like. You don't have to pitch them and explain them how it works. You just send the email to them and that's it. They're going to get back to you. I want to get involved with this. Right. Because there's so many people that have money, but they don't want to do the work. They'd rather just be a limited partner, give the funds, let it do work for them, but they're not going to put all the front end work into it. So I think people are often surprised. You know, they think that investing or finding investors or raising capital is extremely difficult, but you just start asking around and people who trust you will say, oh yeah, I've got cash. I don't know what to do with it. And then you help educate them. Yes, Angela, thank you so much. I want to be mindful of your time. I know we're going there. Thank you so much for coming up in my podcast. Everyone deserves a chance. It's made for people like you and me, normal guys that are just putting themselves out there for the, the good of the game, I call it, right? So tell us one more time, Angela, Empower Her Money. That's the name of the website, right? Yeah. Empowerhermoney.com is the website. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Instagram, TikTok, Empower Her Money. It's my handle everywhere. Okay. And you're going to find more details in the description of this podcast. As soon as I'm going to release it, I'm going to have all these links in there. And please do not hesitate to contact Angela. It's exactly like she said, you first, you got to invest in yourself, your education, you got to get your goals in order. If you don't know where you're going is that ship that lives from Miami without a GPS, right? That I was mentioning earlier. That's the same exact thing. And then you need the actual tools to make these investments. It's not just a goal on a piece of paper that gets tossed around. You have to have uh, um, the vision board, right? The one that you were talking about. It has right. to be in forefront. And then you have to have a plan. Well, building that plan takes skills and knowledge and having a mentor to do that with you and for you, it's what I'm advocating for. And it doesn't resonate with a lot of people I know because we're bombarded with millions of courses, classes. Everybody wants a penny out of our pocket, right? For mm -hmm. something that we might be a little bit interested in. But at the end of the day is the commitment that you have to yourself. Choose and pick your battles, but don't stay on the fence. Right. That's, that's my advice to all of you. Angela, thank you so much. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation and uh, looking forward in and speaking with you and working with you in the future. My partner is directly involved in the same deal that you're involved with. And I'm directly involved with the same syndication. So definitely we're going to see each other soon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care.